Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And today we have a special show uh, because it's a first time guest to the show, although someone that you're probably already well familiar with because he wrote really one of the great books of financial history as I'm awkwardly holding it up there, but I think you can see it. The Creature from Jekyll Island. I am joined by G. Edward Griffin, who also runs Red Pill University puts on the Red Pill Expo, and whose really fascinating and incredible career has led to people like me even becoming aware of, wait, this Federal Reserve <laughs> Scheme might be the biggest racket of all time. The emperor is running around naked. And um, so, Mr. Griffin, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining me. And how are you doing? Well, thank you, Chris. I'm doing fine. Actually, my, my life hasn't changed, been changed much by this uh, coronavirus theater. But uh, I know most people it has affected. I work primarily out of my home anyway. And uh, so I, I, I'm uh, sheltered in place. I've been sheltered in place for years and years and years. But boy, when I step outside of the door and go into town and see all these poor souls that are just eating this propaganda up, and they're believing everything they see because it's coming from the authorities. It just makes me want to cry because I know their lives are really messed up right now. Yeah, it's unfortunate, although I guess you can only share what you see and let people who are ready for that follow along, which fortunately you've done. Although for perhaps people who might be still breaking out of, shall we call it the matrix, uh, how would you introduce this to someone or put things in perspective where maybe it's like they're saying, gee, the Fed's printing trillions out of pop here. And, you know, I hear these gold and silver bugs. They sound a little crazy, but what would you say to someone who's a little bit new to all of this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I, uh, I speak to a lot of people every day when I get out of my little cocoon here who are new to it. Because I think, you know, most people still are. But I think the fact of the matter is that almost everybody has a, a feeling and the little sensation at the back of their neck that makes the hair stand up that there's something wrong. I mean, things just, it, even if you don't really know what's going, you know that's not right. So I think especially lately today where things are so much out of kilter and the wheels seem to be coming off of the cart, people are more open and they're, they don't laugh so readily when you say, well, you know, there are hidden agendas out there. You can laugh all you want to about conspiracy theory, but take a look at history. I mean, every page of history, if you read it carefully, is talking about a conspiracy of some kind. Conspiracies are the most common phenomena in history. And uh, anybody that says <laughs> that they laugh at somebody who's got a conspiracy theory, I feel sorry for them because they've never read a history book. It's everywhere. And so anyway, that's, I, I don't want to sound superior in any way because I didn't always understand this myself. I don't think you don't come out of the womb knowing these things and it depends on your family environment. My family was not aware of this. The people that raised me, excellent, my aunt, I was raised by my aunt and my grandmother. I uh, came from a broken family, so I was taken in, and thank God that was the case. They were excellent ladies, and they, they just took care of me and gave me a good education and taught me a lot of good values, but they had no idea of what I'm talking about today. So had I not just accidentally run across some information and had apparently had a crusader gene in me that started to vibrate, I, <laughs> I remember those days thinking, oh, wait till I tell everybody about this. Are they going to be surprised, you know? And then I found out, well, they didn't really want to hear about it because it was upsetting. And besides, they didn't believe it anyway, didn't believe it anyway because it wasn't on the news. So that's what, uh, so I, I speak from having been at all levels of this discussion. So uh, what do I tell people on the, uh, uh, on the entry point. What do I tell them? I guess it just depends how the conversation is and what it seems that they're, they're aware of. I, I might talk differently to uh, somebody in the library than I would to somebody that's serving me my breakfast in a, 
in a Denny's or something like that. And, and, but even that isn't a good test because some of the best informed people in the world are serving breakfast in Denny's. And some of the least informed people are down at the library reading all those thick propaganda books. So there's no answer, I'm afraid. I can't think of any as I'm sort of babbling on here, hoping that an idea will come to mind as we go. But I don't have anything to say to, in general except to find out where people are. Do they have do they have suspicions or under, questions about their understanding? And I suppose the best thing, now I just got an idea. I see I talked long enough. I knew that something would come up. And um, I do, I do uh, say that I have found that asking questions is always better than making statements yeah. when you're talking to somebody and you're not sure. So instead of saying, boy, these uh, criminals are sure messing up our lives, aren't they? I would say, boy, uh, what do you think about what's going on in the world today? And let, let's see what they say, you know, and play upon that. Everybody knows that something is wrong. Yeah, and it's interesting how you point out it's not a specific race or a specific background or education where it's like this. You know, I think sometimes it's almost similar to what we grew up watching in The Godfather or Goodfellas, where it's like this mafia that's distorting the science the finance, you know, launching these wars. And I thought it was interesting. You mentioned before we hit the record button that when you wrote the book, you didn't think anybody was going to read it. And I was convinced of that. And uh, <clears throat> my wife was too. <laughs> and no. not, that she, not that she didn't support me. She knew that, that I just had to do it because I thought it needed to be said in a way that maybe someday in a future civilization, when they uncover the dust, <laughs> they might find a copy of this book and say, oh, this is what was going on. Uh, that was really my attitude. I thought it would, might have a, a little niche in a, a few libraries and a few collectors' uh, libraries and so forth. But the fact that it would go like it has done now through many, many printings, five editions, almost a million copies, and all of that, and it's a topic every day on the internet. I never dreamed in my wildest imaginations that it would turn out that way. Well, I think there's going to be hopefully a new wave of interest as people are exposed because, again, as I was reviewing the book in the past week, it's, it's amazing how so much of what you've written about, I think, like you said, it's people sense it. There's that intuitional guidance that we have that we've been trained to look away from but there's so many things in here that tie into what is happening now. Perhaps to start, you could mention that great quote, the give me the control of the nation's money supply, and I don't care who you put in the government, because you know we see all the, the, pol the political debates on TV, but very few people know about how much of an influence really the Federal Reserve has. And Perhaps you could start with that, and we'll dig into a little Rothschild well, from there. Sure. The, the quote is attributed to uh, Nathan Rothschild, and um, there's no way to prove that he ever said that. Uh, I mean, I couldn't find an origin of that quote. Everybody uses it, and uh, so I used it too, but I did state in my book, trying to be as transparent and, and honest as I could, that I couldn't find the original source of it. Nevertheless, there's no doubt that uh, Rothschild operated on that formula because you can see that in everything he did in his life. And it's, uh, it's, it's, not, um, it's, it's not something that you would have to condemn a person for saying. It's, it's not an evil thing to say. Um, I would say that. Uh, basically, the, the quote is translated uh, or interpreted as, uh, give me the power to create the money, and I care not who makes the laws, something like that. And, um, that's a truth. <laughs> it's a truth. So thank you, Mr. Rothschild, for explaining something that's very true. And a lot of people haven't thought about it. If, if a group of people or one person or a group of people, bankers or a cabal or some uh, hidden secret society or just uh, members of the same church or just any small group of people give them the power to create the money that everybody is forced to use by law, then you can buy up all the politicians you wish and you own the government. It's as simple as that. That's what's happening in our world today. We have a government which we think is a representative government, 
And we believe that because there's a big hoopla. Every couple of years we go to the polls and we vote for candidates who have been selected by people we don't know. We, I, where did these candidates come from? How come they're on the ballot? Don't even question that. All the real selection and all the work was done by the time you say, who's on the ballot? You know, well, man, it's all over by then. Uh, so, so we think because we go to the, the polls and, and we vote that somehow we are in control of our own political destiny and we don't ask a lot of questions. And so we think that because there are elections and we vote for candidates, these, some of these candidates become officials in the government that they are responsive to our will because we voted for them. What, you talk about an absurd <laughs> interpretation of the world. That is as far from the truth as it can be. And I think by now everybody, even that if they don't know the details, would have to say, yeah, I've, I've observed that. No matter who we vote for, we think we're throwing out one group of criminals, and when we find out we just put in another group just like it, but they gave us good speeches, and we loved them when they were on the campaign trail because they said everything we wanted them to say. And so everybody is beginning to realize they've been tricked, 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 tricked by the same trick over and over and over again. So now they're beginning to think, yeah, maybe it really doesn't make any difference all all this business about the elections and the campaigns and and these guys fighting each other republicans versus democrats and then they oh man all this nothing changes and so people are waking up to that so when we come back and we say well listen to rothschild he says i don't care who passes the laws give me the power to make the money and i'll own those people bingo now we understand the reality of the world yeah, and taking that a step further, as you detailed quite eloquently in the book, how a lot of the war policy is tied into that. So when you see that the banks are often funding both sides of the war, it makes you wonder where are the true division lines. Is it really country A against country B? Or um, if you could speak to that, just that whole scheme that you know gets involved with the politics and the military and, and how we've been duped by a lot of what we've been told. Well, since we started off looking at this, uh, the situation from the banker perspective and the control of money, which I think is a, uh, probably the best place to start because money, like water, permeates everything, you know. Mm -hmm. If there's the slightest little crack or hole, it'll, you'll find money is there and very important ingredient of, work, of what you see. So let's stick with that for the moment. And... Um, if you do that and you study the, the history of banks and who they, uh, who they lend money to, especially governments, the big banks we're talking about, not the little bank that's struggling against the big banks just to survive, but the big banks, the international banks. And you realize that a great deal of the profitability from these banks well, I shouldn't say great deal, all of it, all of the profitability from banks comes from interest on loans. And so therefore, the goal of any bank is to make loans and big loans. And the bigger the loans, the better they like it because in one simple contract, instead of dealing with Ma and Pa trying to borrow thirty dollars or $40,000 to fix up their little um, gas station or their hardware store, uh, they're loaning billions of dollars, bingo, one signature, to a large corporation or to a country or to an institution of some kind. And the interest on that now gets interest, interesting <laughs> because it's so big. So when you're, you're looking at this kind of an operation and you realize that the people who are making those loans are very um, objective people. They're, they're not emotional. They don't let things like love or patriotism get in the way of making a billion dollars, let's put it that way. So their eyes are focused on how to make the most money. And so they don't think in terms of, well, I will turn down this $20 billion profitable contract because it's not in the best interest of my country. Never will you find that. Right. And starting at, in my view, about um, well, at least 100 years ago, the mentality of these people in this business, international banking, has dumped any concept of loyalty to nation. 
they even describe themselves very openly and willingly as internationalists. Oh, they'll give some lip service to being, yeah, I'm a nationalist. I, I mean, I'm an American. I was born in America, or I'm a German, or I'm a Frenchman, or whatever it is. But when they get together at their international conferences, and they meet in Basel, Switzerland, and they go to meetings of the International Monetary Fund, you never hear them talking as citizens of their own countries, and they don't think as citizens of their own countries. They think of themselves as influential movers and shakers of the international community, and most of them call it the New World Order. It's their phrase. Yep. They don't like people like us to, to mention that. In fact, you can even get knocked off of some of the social media and get, get your website degraded if you, if you say New World Order too many times or use it in a derogatory way. It's, it's amazing. But anyway, it, that's the word, the phrase they have used for a long time. And so these people are internationalists. Let's cut to the chase here. So uh, that's, once you understand that the big, biggest powers in the world, the ones that make the money and determine who gets it and at what interest rates and all of that, and you realize that they are not, their mind is nowhere ever in terms of what this does for their nation of birth. It's always in terms of building and reinforcing this unity of their own structure. Call it what you will. It's a, it's a banking fraternity. It's a monetary system. I tend to prefer the word cabal uh, because they are like a, uh, well, they're, they're like a, a union of bankers who share their same interests. Uh, they're a cartel of banks, different words you can use for the same thing, but they're a fraternity of bankers, and they have a common interest. They work together. Sometimes they compete with each other a little bit, but the competition is always held at a very low level because right. they know that through unity, they are able to achieve their best interests. Now, does, that's my view of what's going on in the world. Is this a conspiracy? N not necessarily, because first of all, it's right out in the open. And uh, one of the tests of a conspiracy is it has to be in secret. Well, a lot of things they do are in secret, uh, but the, uh, the overall pattern of what I've just described is not in secret at all. So uh, it's not a conspiracy in that sense of the word. It's just one, it's a fact of life that is pretty well concealed from the average citizen of the world because it's to the interests of this cabal that people don't think about this. They'd like to think that their governments are really independent and that the people they elect right. are really working for them and that going to the polls and casting their vote is really means something. So that way they can be placated. They can be passive when everything goes sour. They can say, well, gee, it just happened. Everybody was trying to do their best. Because I voted for good people and they were thwarted by bad people somewhere or they, turn, they turned from good to bad and so forth. They, they think that what they view is the real thing when they don't understand that behind all this, there is this interlocking, this commonality of interest, this uh, conformity of movement, and there's no room in that for national interests, and certainly no room in it for individual responsibility, the individual uh, freedom and liberty and uh, privacy. It's out the window. So uh, that's how I see the real world, and it's not a pretty view. And it's not a pretty view in a couple of ways. First of all, it, it's kind of scary because it means that you, um, you don't have the control that you thought. And that leads to the second reason it's not a pretty thing is that means if you want to change it, you've got to get up off of your fat couch and go out and do something about it and take on responsibility, become active, and start to fight these forces. And nobody really wants to do that, so they don't want to hear this message because it means that if it's true, uh-oh, They've got to do something about it. Well, I agree with everything except perhaps that last part where I think there's more and more now that are, are I think the people who will be watching this call are, and are excited about that. And I, that, that's what gives me hope is that. And, and well, I, yeah, think, I agree with that. I, I, if I stated it otherwise, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean no. that everybody was like that. No, of course not. I mean, you're not, I'm not, and, and most of the people I associate with are not that way at all. And, uh, but, but uh, you know, the, what they sometimes refer to as the gum-chewing public, <laughs> and I, that's a derogatory term, I don't like it, because I was one of those, I didn't chew gum, but I was definitely part of the gum-chewing public at one time. But it, it is a large group of people, 
And the fact is that history has always been written by a small group of people. Yeah, In yeah, fact, yeah. if you really look at the numbers, it's about 1% of the population that really does anything in terms of changing society and bringing about momentous changes. Take a look at our American Revolution, for example. It was led by how many people? How many people signed the Declaration of Independence? How many people uh, signed the Constitution? How many people wrote those pamphlets? How many people were really the leaders? I don't know the number, but I'll bet it was under 200. Right. 200 people yeah. were responsible for the American Revolution. Now think about that. Now the rest went along, and there was like 15% that probably supported it, supported it with their lives and their fortunes, yes. But the leaders, the ones that really made it happen, are always less, way less than 1% of the population. This is what we need to turn this around. So when you realize that, that reality, it's not so discouraging. You think, oh my gosh, we can do that, 1%, easy, let's go. Yeah, and I think there's just something about when you tell people the truth that just resonates, they feel it, and also, I mean, I get it on one hand why it can be overwhelming. And I was asleep until, uh, geez, uh, maybe 12 years ago. And then once, you know, and we all respond differently. I mean, on one hand, I get it. Like, how are you supposed to respond when like, I mean, the, the, on some level, yeah, they're trying to they keep raising inflation, the price of everything, make life harder for people. Uh, I have some questions of where this virus came from. I mean, is this the next thing in the playbook so i get it how it's hard for some people to accept although again i don't know i think once you embrace anything and say all right you know this isn't it's a little bizarre you know <laughs> but what what can you do is it's quite empowering in its own way mm -hmm. yeah that first crack in the egg is always the hardest one but after, after you realize that something really really important in your life it was a fraud and it was wasn't at all what you thought it was once you see that something really important to you was based on it on a lie yep. then the next discovery is a little easier because you think oh it happened once i wonder what else i've been fooled on yeah and unfortunately uh, a lot of the financial system is based on that premise these days I was wondering if you could explain to folks what happened with the Rothschilds and the Battle, Battle of Waterloo, which, and then maybe we can dig into how that theme is being repeated in some present day events. Yeah, thanks for asking me that. I, I haven't visited that piece of history in quite a while, so I don't have as many details that I would like to have. But basically the story has been told many times. It's, <clears throat> I found it easy to locate in the history books, but uh, not in the ones that, that they tend to uh, use in schools. If you go outside of the schools, you find more old history books that have the story. Well, basically, the, the Rothschild banking family uh, existed at this point in history during the, the, uh, uh, the war against Napoleon. It was the, the war between Britain and, uh, and France, and Napoleon was the uh, the greatest challenger to the uh, to to the Brits, and so it was a big important turning point for uh, for England. Could they defeat um, uh, Napoleon, or was Napoleon going to win? And um, this was some place in the Pyrenees Mountains, where the battle was going to be held, and uh, it made all the difference in the world to the survival of England, and that meant. Uh, now, they're, now, getting back to the issue of who cares about England and who cares about money, those two things, you see. And we found out that it was, even then, in financial circles, there was more concern about the money than there was about the nation, believe it or not, because everybody of substance had loaned money to the government, you know, like bonds. We make, make individuals make loans to the to the government here in the United States, we buy bonds, or at least if there's a war, we're always encouraged to buy bonds, you know? So we loan money to the government. And now if the government loses the war, the nation loses the war, what happens to that loan? It's gone, you know? It's, it's not only has the nation been lost, but if you've got money, you can usually do pretty well in, in no matter what regime it is. You know, you've got money, you can buy these politicians, as we said. You can buy conquerors, too, if you've got money. 
And so, but the concern was, oh my gosh, if we lose the war, our bonds are no good. Right. So this was the, what the great concern was. It was, it was Napoleon going to wipe out all of these loans to the British government. <laughs> and uh, so, all right, I made too much of that, no doubt. But there was a lot of anxieties as, about how was the war going to turn out? This one battle was coming up. They knew it was going to be a, a major battle that would determine the fate of the conflict. And there was no doubt that Wellington uh, had the ability to defeat Napoleon, but Wellington didn't have any resources. He was, his, his supply lines were stretched. He, had, he couldn't feed his army. He couldn't supply them. And so what good is an army if, if they don't have food? They start going home. <laughs> You know, <laughs> there are defections going on. If they don't have ammunition for their, for their rifles or don't have rifles, what good is an army? So this was the critical point, was how to get money. In this case, it, this was a period when gold was the only real money. How do you get gold to Wellington so he could buy supplies and, and be a formidable military force in the, in the battle, battle of, I guess it was Waterloo? And, uh, so the whole thing hinged on how to get the money out of London, where it was, all the gold was there, and get it to the troops uh, for, um, for Wellington. Well, they had to move the money by carrier, actually physically move it through enemy territory. It was a big maneuver. But this is where the Rothschild banking dynasty came in because uh, Rothschild had these sons, and there was one in England, one in France, one in Germany. And these sons had their own banking institutions going pretty well. And they all came into play, and they did some, some rather um, covert, amazing covert operations to, to move this huge hoard of gold right through enemy territory, right through France, and into the hands of, um, of Wellington. And the, uh, this is a very interesting story of how the sons actually fooled the government officials. Some of them, they fooled them. Some of them, they paid, the, paid them off, told them to go take a little two-week vacation with the wife and not be around at a certain entry point when the gold came through. And they thought that was a good idea. The wife would like that. And so they were bought off. And uh, so and a lot of things happened. The gold went through. It, they paid off. They bought the, the uh, food and the ammo and the rifles, and they got everything all paid for, and then the battle happened, and the deal was, well, who won? And, uh, and all, of, all of the financial, all the financial investors back in London were down there at what, the, the, what we would call the stock exchange, and they were waiting to know whether they should buy or sell their bonds. Which they, are the bonds good? In which case, that was a good investment. And it would be good if Wellington won the war, if Wellington won the battle, I should say. If Wellington if lost the battle to Napoleon, nobody would want those bonds, and they'd be sold at pennies on the dollar. So they were waiting for news to come back. Who won the battle? Well, Rothschild had his courier service uh, faster than the, than the government. They had guys with horses lined up, just like the Pony Express we've heard about in the West, only probably better. And so the news was traveled through the Rothschild communication line of couriers and got to London, I've forgotten the exact number of hours, but I'm going to guess around 10 or 12 hours earlier than the government agency got through with their horses and carrier services. And so everybody, everybody knew that, uh, that this would happen. So when the stock exchange opened, there was um, Rothschild standing at his post. That they had these pillars, and they, I guess that's how it worked. There, all the major traders had a certain place that they could be depended on to find them there. And, and there was the Rothschild at his post, and they even have uh, character drawings of this in history books, which I found were very interesting. So there's Rothschild standing at his post with his silk hat on and, and his black coat, and he's he's go he's trading in, in the stock exchange there. Well. Rothschild got the word that Wellington won the battle. Right. So what did he do? He's the only person right now, and the courier, who knew in London. So he put the frown on his face, and he was shaking his head, and he started to sell, sell his stock. And everybody said, what? Nathan is selling. Nathan is selling. And then Nathan sold some more. He's really selling. And Nathan sold some more, bigger block. Nathan selling, and we must have lost the war. And so everybody started to sell. It became a panic. It just went through the whole place, like in a matter of minutes. 
Well, naturally, when that happened, he had his agents out there buying the thing up. Everything is bought up in pennies on the dollar. Now, that's a, a tremendous, interesting story. And you can't, you can't really blame Rothschild for doing that. I mean, that was not an evil thing to do. I mean, this sort of thing is done all the time in markets where people have information that others don't have. Now, they're not going to tell the, their competitors this information. They'll use it to their advantage. So it was a brilliant strategy. You can't say, oh, that dirty guy, Rothschild, look what he did. Well, it was just what anybody might have done. And it just, in other words, I'm glad you asked about that because, first of all, it's a very interesting story, but it, it emphasizes what we were talking about a moment ago, is that the bankers really couldn't give a hoot about nationality. I mean, if, if uh, Wellington had lost the war, lost the battle, I don't know what Nathan would have done, but he probably would have started to buy. <laughs> he would have started buying bonds. And everybody would say, oh, look, <laughs> he, they won the battle, so the bonds are good, and then everybody would have, would have bid the prices up and so forth. Uh, um, anyway, that's what happened. That's the story, and I urge anybody that's interested to, to go to my book and get some more interesting details on any other history book on that period. Uh, really, it's, it's a fascinating piece of history. So that's part one of my interview with G. Edward Griffin. And obviously, you know, in part two, I asked him about silver and a bunch of other good stuff, as well as how he sees this all turning out, playing out what people can actually do. And he shared some incredible history. So I think you'll enjoy that. Go ahead, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way you can stay posted as soon as it's released. And